Welcome to the MUFG Global Markets Asia podcast. My name is Michael Wan, Senior Currency Analyst with the MUFG Global Markets Research Team. I'm joined today by Kia Ferreras, Vice President, Treasury Sales with MUFG Philippines. Today is 30th July 2024. The following podcast is for informational purposes only. It is intended for professional investors and eligible counterparties and not for retail clients. Any content should not be regarded as an offer to conduct investment businesses or investment recommendations. Hi, Michael. Good morning. How are you? Hi, good morning, Kia. I'm good, thank you. That's good to know. Well, it's really good to chat with you today, especially coming from Typhoon Karina. How's it going there in Singapore? Um, yeah, it's going great. It's going great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, our thoughts and prayers certainly go out to everyone affected by Typhoon Karina. Uh, and certainly everyone, please stay safe in, in the Philippines. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, with a week ahead, there is definitely a lot to unpack with regards to recent market developments and what they may mean for the Philippine peso, BSP policy, and also the Philippines market more generally. I wanted to first start us off with global developments before talking about what's happening specifically in the Philippines. It's certainly quite a big week ahead for global central banks, with the Fed, Bank of Japan, and Bank of England all meeting. Could you walk us through your expectations and also what that might mean for the path toward for the U.S. dollar and rates over the next six to twelve months. Yeah, sure. Um, so, like you mentioned, Kia, it's certainly quite a big week this week for global central banks. Uh, the U.S. central bank is meeting the Bank of Japan as well, together with the Bank of England. Um, our expectation is that the Fed uh, will not change rates, but I think this we think there's a possibility that they could potentially signal or hint uh, the path towards recalibrating rates moving forward. Uh, the broader macro picture in the US is that it's slowing down and entering into a little bit of a soft patch. And we think that um, this, uh, you know, if the Fed doesn't cut rates, um, economic growth could slow down a little bit more moving forward. Um, so that's one. Um, but on the flip side, I think the interesting part is the Bank of Japan, where it's moving against what other central banks are doing. Uh, and over here um, in, in its meeting for the BOJ, we do expect the BOJ to hike rates by 15 basis points uh, and signal its path towards bond purchase reduction uh, and start the sort of gradual path towards um, uh, rate uh, increases uh, moving forward for Japan. So I think for uh, in terms of your question specifically, in terms of what it means for the US dollar and rates, we do think that the the path forward we it's it's for a weaker dollar, um, both because the Fed is expected to to um to cut rates uh, uh starting from September and that's our call, and also because we do expect some global, uh some gradual improvement in global growth moving forward, which should help uh, support our view for a weaker dollar moving forward as well. Noted here, Michael. Thanks for your insights. Um, besides the Fed, there are certainly also other factors pushing the dollar in different directions. Could you walk us through some of these factors, perhaps including what's happening in China with the surprise rate cuts and also the U.S. elections? I mean, we've had inquiries from clients, you know, if Trump wins, should we anticipate any policy changes that could impact the foreign exchange market? And given that China made a surprise cut, Will this have a short-term impact on the FX market? Yeah, yeah, those are certainly great questions as well. Um, so in terms of uh, the US dollar, it's uh, it's not just about the Fed, but also about things such as global growth and, of course, policy and politics. Uh, and you mentioned, of course, um, the US elections. And I think over here, it's, it's still quite uncertain as to who exactly will win. But if prediction markets are uh, anything to go by, uh, it seems like the base case is for um, former President Trump to, to be the next president. And I think over here, uh, even if we assume that you know President Trump uh, comes into power again, uh, there are also many different policies uh, moving in different directions uh, that he's talked about. Uh, 
uh, for one, he's talked about tariffs, which, uh, uh, you know, if implemented in full, uh, would be, uh, you know, a positive for the dollar, so the do dollar strength. But yet at the same time, you know, he's talked about his pension towards wanting the dollar to be weaker and interest rates to be lower. So that moves in, in the other direction. Uh, together with you know some of his policies to extend the uh, tax cuts and jobs act uh, and and other deregulation type factors so uh net net what, what i'm trying to say is that um you know there's certainly uh many different policies that uh former president trump has talked about and i do think it's something which uh, uh instead of calling for a specific direction we should think more about hedging and think more about um the the, the sort of different scenarios rather than taking a specific directional call on that. Uh, so that's on the first part, which is US elections. Uh, the second part, which is China, I think certainly, um, you know, China has surprised in terms of rate cuts. And the broader point is that we do think that uh, China requires a little bit more stimulus to support its economy. Uh, and it speaks to the, the fact that, you know, uh, global growth momentum is still on a relatively weak footing. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we, we do see some gradual improvement um, um, moving forward as well. So I think that um, more broader than just rate cuts, we do expect more stimulus uh, out of China, uh, which should turn sentiment around, which has been quite weak uh, at, at this point in time, which should uh, result in slightly weaker dollar moving forward. Um, yeah. Thanks, Michael. So if you don't mind, we'll quickly turn now to the Philippines where the BSP seems to have turned more dovish over the last couple of months. What do you think is driving this and what are your expectations for BSP policy rates moving forward, including for the upcoming meeting in August? Yep, yep. So uh, certainly one key driver of Philippines assets, including fixed income markets has been the uh, tilt by the BSP uh, towards becoming more dovish, especially from the May a policy meeting. And I think over there, uh, what's happening is that uh, the growth data has come in a little bit weaker than they expect. And I think in terms of their in-house central bank models, the, the idea is that the, the lagged impact of higher interest rates and higher real interest rates will increasingly feed into growth moving forward. And, and so um, the, the thinking from the central bank, it's by looking forward into the path of the economy ahead, uh, you know, given that, you know, inflation is expected to moderate uh, over the next um, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and given, you know, current high nominal interest rates of 6.5%, um, the central bank thinks that it has some space to, to recalibrate rates and um, reduce the, the restrictiveness of, of, um, of policy rates uh, uh, in, in its upcoming meetings. So the, the exact timing, it's, it's of course uh, always unclear, but, but I think that um, uh, with the BSP, it would certainly want to um, not be too far ahead of the Fed. You know, even as governor, uh, BSP governor has mentioned that uh, it, it has some space to, to move in its own speed and in its own sort of uh, rhythm, uh, if you like, uh, not just due to the Fed. So I think the, the bias for the central bank is um, to tolerate uh, a little bit of, of FX weakness uh, relative to in the past. Uh, and I do officially call uh, for policy rate cut in August. Uh, and for 50 basis points of rate cuts in total uh, in 2024, uh, with, with I think more to come in, in 2025 as well. Noted on these, Michael. How about the Philippine peso more generally? The peso has underperformed quite a bit since April. Do you expect this to continue? And where do you see the dollar peso from here? Yeah, so um, what, what I mentioned about the BSP um, thinking and its direction has been one big driver of the Philippines peso. And I think that in part explains why the Philippine peso has underperformed, as you rightly mentioned, uh, quite a bit since April weakening by about 4% uh, when some other currencies have actually strengthened in Asia. So I, I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I think, however, what's important to note is that um, I think now BSP rate cuts are probably much better priced by the markets, including by the FX markets. 
And I do think that relative to the fundamentals of the economy, um, including the fact that you know the the trade deficit, it's it's quite okay. Um, you know, running around four to four point five billion, which is much lower than the kind of like five to six billion rates that we saw uh, certainly at the peak of the uh, 2022. So it's it, there's been quite a big gap that has opened up between dollar peso and and the level of the the trade deficit. Um, and um, I, I do think that there's there's a little bit of space for dollar peso to, to come off, uh, notwithstanding the, the broader dollar trend that, that I mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll list down at least, I think, um, three other supportive factors, I think, for the peso. Uh, one is that um, inflation looks much better managed. And I think on uh, partly because you have the 15%, uh, sorry, the, the, the in rice import tariff cuts from 35%, to 15% that was announced uh, recently uh, by President Marcos. Uh, and number two is that we do see FDI, foreign direct investment approvals uh, search so far. Um, and and the, the lack impact of this should start to feed through uh, more evidently um, in the second half of this year. And I think last but not least, um, given you know, the, the lower inflation, resident labor market, um, pick up in credit growth in among banks. Uh, we do think that there's some space for growth to, to improve gradually, uh, notwithstanding some of the downside risks to watch out for. Um, and, and all this should combine to support uh, portfolio inflows um, and, and result in, in a sort of better uh, balance when it comes to, to, to dollar peso moving forward. You mentioned uh, President Marco's recent speech. So if we could just quickly transition on that. Um, are there any implications from his speech that you would like to highlight? I think at, at the high level, he mentioned um, possible economic implications and pogos relating to the ban, you know, focus on bringing food inflation down, and as well as touched on tax reforms. Uh, would you be able to walk us through those? Yeah, so... There are, there are quite a lot of um, things that have been mentioned in the Sona, President Marcos Sona speech. But I think the sort of three big picture takeaways from my perspective, it's number one, um, the emphasis in bringing uh, food inflation down. And President Marcos certainly listed that at the very top of his agenda in the speech. And I, I think that goes to show that um, you know, food inflation uh, rice prices are certainly top of mind among um, uh, the consumers and households. And uh, the sort of recent um, rice import tariff cuts from 35% to 15%, I think by, by our estimates could reduce inflation anywhere between uh, 0 0.2 to um, sort of like one percentage points, depending on your assumptions. So it's, it's been quite a big driver of inflation in terms of rice inflation, uh, right now accounting for about two percentage points out of um, the 4% year-on-year rates in, in CPI. Um, so yeah, that, that's one. So I think there'll be, there, there could be more um, sort of measures moving forward given the emphasis on that. Uh, number two, it's, I, I think it speaks to the, the sort of slower pace of fiscal con consolidation. Um, previously, there was um, a, a plan to bring the fiscal deficit down to 3% of GDP by 2028. Uh, and it was announced that it will be uh, changed uh, and tilted uh, uh, to be larger and a slower pace of, of consolidation. And I think in the SONA speech, um, there was a little bit less sort of emphasis and talks about tax reforms relative to the last SONA. Uh, and with that, um, there was some uh, mention about the Create More Act to uh, change the fiscal tax incentives um, uh, for foreign investors. But, but broadly speaking, uh, the, the, the path is for a little bit more growth support uh, moving forward from uh, the government balances. And I think it, it's good in that it's, it's more realistic in terms of their assumptions. And last but not least, I think um, you mentioned about the POGOS or the Philippines Offshore Gaming um, Organization uh, 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 bans. And this was certainly listed at the very last uh, element of, of his speech. And um, I think the, the sort of analysis shows that the, the immediate economic impact should be manageable at roughly 0.2% of GDP in terms of direct benefits. 
and roughly 0.1% of total employment, um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of both foreign and, and local um, uh, employees. So I think the, the possible economic implications should be quite small. Um, but of course, um, you know, we have to put this in a broader context of also some of the global risks that we, we, we discussed earlier about, you know, Trump and the US elections, which um, has, has to be watched out very closely for. Noted on these, Michael. So just to close, um, and as we have always, you know, received this question from our clients, uh, what are the main and key risk factors that they should also watch out for moving forward for the Philippine market, both from a local and a global perspective? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just to put our forecast up there, I mean, in terms of dollar peso, we are, we are effectively um, calling for dollar peso to, to trend uh, a little bit lower over the medium term, uh, over the next six to 12 months. Uh, so roughly 58 uh, kind of levels, I think, are, are reasonable uh, to our minds. Uh, so some downward bias o uh, over the, the, the course of the next 12 months. But uh, as you rightly pointed out, um, the, the sort of risk to our forecast includes the potential policy changes from Trump, uh, in includes um, the fact that you know there's, there seems to be a little bit of uh, negative economic surprises out of global growth. Um, I mean, I think Philippines should be a little bit more insulated relative to the, the higher beta currencies uh, such as Korea and Taiwan, but uh, it will still be nonetheless, nonetheless impacted. And of course, on the global front, uh, our expectation for the Fed to cut uh, will be quite crucial in, terms, in this regard uh, for, for a, a weaker US dollar uh, uh, over the course of our forecast horizon. I think from a domestic perspective, um, uh, the impact of Typhoon Karina uh, should be quite closely watched out for. Um, I, I, my, my sort of base case assumption is that, that there may be a little bit of short-term impact, uh, but it should reverse over time. Uh, but also the potential impact of inflation, such as um, impact of crops and agriculture, which could um, put a bit of spanner in the works, if you like, uh, in terms of the BSP uh, and, and its rate cuts. Um, my, my sort of base case on, on that front is that um, even if there's a little bit of short-term uh, sort of vegetable price spikes, for instance, uh, given that it, it's a short-term supply side shock uh, and it normalizes over time, I think I think the BSP um, over into 2025 will still have space to cut rates given that inflation is better managed with the rise import tariff cuts, uh, among other things. Um, yeah, so those are the key things we'll watch out for. And... And I think in terms of the, the Philippines as well, um, the sort of ongoing geopolitical tensions between China and the Philippines uh, should be watched out very closely for as well. But um, our base case is that it should be quite manageable at this point in time. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for your time. So we'll speak after the upcoming meeting in August. Great. Thank you so much, Kia. Thank you for listening to the MUFG Global Markets Asia podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you subscribe to your podcast. Contact your MUFG sales representative for more information. Check back again for more insights from the Global Markets Research Team.